Hi, and welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Monica Prophet. I'm here with Eric Lamison White, the co founder of the Pareto Network and the inventor of a patent in stable coins. It took, that took four years to get through the SEC, as well as a frequent contributor in the blockchain space as an author and writer of multiple articles. I'm not sure if there's a book in there or if there's a book coming out from there, but sounds like you've got a lot of generated material. Thank you so much, Eric, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. And where are you joining us from? Are you based on the West Coast? Yes, San Francisco. Oh, and how long have you been out there? Um, just three years. I was in Manhattan before that. Ah, that's where I am. Okay, so has it been a, a big a big shift? I feel like I go out to San Francisco and I, I'm, I'm kind of like, it's a big city, but it doesn't feel anything like what I'm used to. Was it hard to get used to? Um, it's a different place. It's a very big country. <laughs> It's a very big country. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, have you spent much time in the, in the uh, it's terrible to say, but the flyover states? Uh, not, not lately. Um, I did make it out to Austin for South by Southwest recently. Oh, I missed you. I was just there. Yeah, okay. that's yeah. fantastic. I, I was like hoping to meet up with more and more people from the uh, crypto and blockchain space, but I got stuck. I mean, there was a lot of blockchain, but it's, it felt like there was so much programming at South by Southwest. Did you get overwhelmed as well? It's a lot, yeah. <laughs> How many days were you out there for it? I think I was there for, I guess, four days. Yeah, it was a good, good amount yeah, of time. Yeah, that's good. I was there for like eight. It was way too much. Way yeah. too much. I mean, I was born in Austin, so I, I ended up seeing a lot of family and friends of family, and it was still a lot. It was, boy, by the time it, the music part started and the tech part ended, I was like, whew, I don't even want to see a show. I'm ready. I just, I just want to go take a long nap. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it is it is a trope. I am, uh, you know, between San Francisco and New York uh, when I'm in the country and yeah. West, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, gosh, how long have you been doing this back and forth? I mean, and working in tech, what's your what's your like kind of long term? How long did, has it, have you been in this crazy world? Not just the tech, that just blockchain, but tech in general. Yeah. So, so my whole career has been in tech. Um, so. I would say, you know, professionally, maybe um, 10 years, the same with finance and, you know, and the crypto aspect of that's just been a piece that's gotten bigger and bigger of, of that. So, but it's been there for a good eight years as oh. well. So at this point, I guess it's just all one and the same. <laughs> it is all one and the same. But when did crypto come onto the scene for you? Like, how did you yeah. first get introduced? Or do you even remember the moment that you first got I introduced do. to crypto itself? Yeah, I do. I was introduced to crypto in 2011. And, you know, basically I was working with a company that was trying to do an obvious application of mobile phones, which were smartphones, which was mobile payments and mobile payments with QR codes and all these newfangled technologies at the time. But um, there were a lot of barriers to entry. There were a lot, there were a lot of headaches to actually do it. We learned about money licenses and all these kind of things. And then there was a free open source Bitcoin wallet that did everything we wanted to do, even use QR codes. And whoever made it wasn't even seemingly trying to monetize. So that's when I was like, who are these guys? Or what is this? <laughs> What's going on here? And then you wow. just go through the mental emotions of like, this shouldn't work. Oh, it's still working. Why does it work? <laughs> <laughs> How can I make it work better? Where can I apply it? How can I get in? That's great. So um, did you study tech and finance or was this something that you fell into because of just like, uh, you know, the, yeah. they say, what is it? The um, inventor, what uh, necessity is the mother of all invention. Was it a necessity based thing or did you really just always have an interest? Yeah, I always had an interest. Um, I majored in computer science and I also worked at the FDIC, which is one of the federal financial regulators. But um, then I actually didn't have any experience with economics, but it happened to be during the financial crisis. So I got a really quick crash course. <laughs> that would be a crash course for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in more ways than one, yes. So, so um, I thought it was really interesting and, you know, left largely discontent with, the, you know, how the money supply worked and just from the inside seeing um, how, you know, resources are actually, you know, appropriated to people and, I thought, okay, maybe there could be a better way. Okay, that's interesting. So between what you just happened to mention, which sounds like 
newfangled, I don't even know what, you said the word money license. That's crazy. I, first of all, I want to know just how does, what is that? And how was that a part? Is there a licensing to money that has to do with how, you know, that is directly tied to how resources and money is distributed or accessible? Or, um, just, if you're, just if you're a payment processor, it's more the, the money service licenses. It's done at a state by state level. And some places, like at the time, this consulting firm found out they needed like, I, I believe it was like a $20 million like bond. And all we wanted to do was put a QR code in a mobile <laughs> you know, you know. And that, like, that would have just covered maybe one state, you know. Oh my God. Um, yeah, even the banks, wow. when they figured out what we were doing, you know, were cutting out all the accounts, you know, really unilaterally. And this had nothing to do with crypto. This was just, you know, the barriers of entry. Um, so oh. crypto, you know, circumvents a lot of that, even though there's a little bit of the same friction. Mm -hmm. You can still oftenly just transact. Wow. So it was really the frictionless. It was, it was really that you saw a QR code, frictionless, open source, easy, in existence. It, that's what really what started putting the pieces together for you to go, oh, crypto, there's something in this whole digital money thing. Well, and, and we were spending, you know, our time on this contract to, to make the same thing. And I was like, okay, we're clearly wasting our time on this <laughs> implementation. Now, okay, that's pretty hard because as an entrepreneur myself, when I have spent my time and my time and my time pushing on this one, this one stone up this one hill, and then I find out like there's no hill and the stone's just rolling around over there. It's like, it's very, it can be hard to let go of the, of the fight that you thought was the good fight, right? And to incorporate the new, was, was that a big shift for you to use, to start thinking, okay, now I'm going to look at the potential of crypto versus, you know, continue working within the existing monetary system. I mean, after the FDIC and everything else, it sounds like you're pretty entrenched in, in fiat. Right. Well, I, it wasn't a big shift for me. Um, it, you know, it, it just comes down to, I guess, a more fundamental abstraction or, or being exposed to a fundamental abstraction of, you know, what value is and what, you know, different market participants actually desire. And it pretty much had nothing to do with, you know, fiat or state controlled money because uh, right. that was just uh, a proxy. That was a proxy. That makes sense. So when you um, made that shift, of course, yeah, I can see how you just look at one system being very locked down, expensive and top heavy and difficult and regulated, centralized, and the other one being very open source and very agile, functional. Um, yeah. That's great. But the user base was so different. Was it difficult to think, I'm going to now be, what is the user, like the global user base of crypto is something like 3% of the population uses crypto at this point. It's just so small. Did you find that that, that contraction of, of total market influence, um, was there any drawback in, to you in that? Um, well, I didn't do anything in the crypto space for a good five years. Um, you, know, you know, I researched for two years and, you know, eventually I was maybe in a place where, you know, it was like, okay, I have the right risk profile to consider wiring money to a sketchy exchange in Japan. Right. And, and so that was a lot of fun. And seeing, you know, just from researching, I was watching, okay, it was like a fraction of a fraction of a percent at that point in time. And I was like, okay, this is a good bet for me. But, um, you know, actually launching a, a business or, or a project publicly would have been 2016 and the size is perfect for that. And 2017 was great. You're right. You're right. So, okay, 2016, you're kind of fast forwarding to that, but I know that you did file a patent. You didn't get it there was a huge gap there, right? So 2016 lands right in the middle of this gap, which sounds like between 2014 and 2018, you were yeah. in this long process. Tell me about the patenting process. What did you get patented? Right, right. So um, the volatility of cryptocurrency was a big barrier to adoption. And ultimately what I patented was a way to have a stable coin. Um, so basically, in 2017, 2018, these started being colloquially called stable coins, but ultimately what I patented achieves the same result. And yeah, you know, so I mentioned I didn't do anything publicly till 2016. So yeah, I had, had and still have things that were in progress since you know, earlier in the decade. And so I did end up filing a patent in, in early or mid-2014 about this. And what it really came down to is that from the finance side, volatility isn't really an argument because these are solved problems. Like you know how to remove volatility from your portfolio. Right. Um, but all the finance people were too busy laughing at crypto. While the crypto people had seemingly no experience in 
any of those states' mechanisms. So, right. so I was like, okay, well, I'm right here in the middle, and I need <laughs> like to patent idea. this. <laughs> I can <laughs> right. right. So um, the, it's good. So the only real exposure I have to like something that is uh, IP that is you know kind of algorithmically based that creates stability in a cryptocurrency is um, gosh, what, I met these guys a couple about a year ago. Basis Coin, it's one. They they say that they just they algorithmically adjust the supply and demand constantly to whatever whatever tr you know current uh, fluctuate not fluctuate whatever the flow is of it right. However many people have bought it, they adjust the supply so it always stays within a fraction of a penny or whatever, you know, within the sure. same value. Is that something similar to what your patent is? Can you explain your patent a little more? Yeah, so, so my patent is really based around delta hedging, um, basically using derivatives to counter um, balance the value of your portfolio. So if you own Bitcoin and it's going up and down all the time, the derivatives always, you know, have gains or losses that keep your account value the same. Now that alone, that by itself isn't the innovation. The innovation is that because the underlying assets, Bitcoin and all cryptos are infinitely divisible, the derivatives can be infinitely divisible. So basically, for example, you have futures contracts um, that accomplish the same thing for pretty cheap or options contracts. But the problem is, or, the way these have been rolled out have been that they really only benefit wealthier people. Um, the investment banks can own these gigantic, really large futures contracts that might cost, you know, a minimum of $4,000 up to $80,000. And you need to have a portfolio worth hedging to really get the benefits of that. Right. Um, with the underlying asset being divisible down to fractions of a penny and more, the, you know, the futures contract in this example could also be worth a fraction of a penny. Uh -huh. Moving this capability or exemption from volatility all the way down to consumers um, in a non-speculative way. So just the consumer itself can get these benefits uh, instead of- Yeah. That's incredible. That's incredible. Do you have any analogy for that when you explain this to people? I mean, because I think- and this is like a super simplistic way, but when you say like making this more accessible all the way down to the consumer, because you can, you can now take these same rewards and make them accessible because of this in infinite divisibility. So really it's a matter of taking things down to the level at which people can afford it without okay. giving them the same upfront cost, like $20 million to be operating in a, you know, like it's ridiculous, right? So you're definitely on that, t that path with, I work oh. in real estate securitization and we're looking at a transaction fee based model so that no matter how much or how little you are investing, it's not like E-Trade where it's always going to be a flat $4 or $10 to enter that market and buy a stock or buy a security that you can actually, you can push that down so that every, everything is right. um, still relational, right? And so yeah. there's these costs that, that a person with more money can always afford and the person without so much money is never going to be able to play in. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, that, that's probably the best way to really describe it. Um, just makes it more, just spans the market, makes it more egalitarian. Um, so which I think a lot of, you know, different parties want that goal. And the patent itself, I mean, it's pretty dry material. Uh, the patents it was inspired by are, are very technical. So I don't, I don't really know the best way, you know, to really- You can't say what it is, you can say what it does. That, like, so we covered yeah. what it does. That's pretty much what it is, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, um, so, you know, like, Basically, you know, any, anybody looking for, you know, a 20 year monopoly in crypto derivatives, you know, well, I've got something they might be interested in. All right. So again, without saying what it is, can you tell me how? So if I'm interested in a 20 year monopoly in derivatives, which uh, let's just say I may or may not be interested in that. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell me how would you convert me into a buyer? What do you have to say to me as a customer uh, if I'm interested in this and I have, you know, a small amount of money to invest? Um. Yeah, I mean, you you would be you would be an investment bank um, that's already considering a portfolio of blockchain related patents, or you know have already patented things in the derivative space, or, or do things like that. So that's pretty much that's pretty much it. And they like they would already kind of get like what what you're doing. About. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you you look at Bank of America; they have this like expanding portfolio. I think they have some pretty complementary patents, um, but a, a lot of their stuff is focused on the fiat side and having yeah. a limited ledger um, kind of 
it's a perspective. <laughs> right, but it is a perspective. Pure decentralized crypto first approach, um, on chain, off chain, a mixture of the two. Yeah, I mean, the, but it would still be, it would be the licensed institutions that could actually roll this kind of product out. So when you talk about licensed institutions and institutions that may be working and operating or interested in operating outside of, crypt, uh, of uh, fiat, what do you, do you see any play or is it, does it mean anything to you in your space that um, JP Morgan has now, you know, been discussing this coin and they're going to be, they're really like becoming much more um, um, focused in the crypto space. Does that, does that have any bearing on what you're up to? It does. It does. So, I mean, it's good that people independently get closer to understanding what's going on. Um, it's a process. Yeah, basically, the any pretty much any corporation um, cannot honestly consider disintermediating everything right. because that disintermediates their revenue models as well. I mean, if you're extracting value from inefficiencies, and so it's fascinating watching you know all the large um, decision makers and, and banks you know, kind of go through the mental hoops that everyone else has to go to. They just, you know, it takes them a little while to look at something as a market worth extracting value from. Right. Um, so, yeah, you know, they dismiss it. They laugh at it. And they... <laughs> and then they adopt it. And yeah, <laughs> then yeah, they yeah, cover yeah. up. Right. right. Yeah, so, so, now they're, so now they're adopting, you know, these kind of half-baked solutions. And there's a lot of consultants... Billing hourly. Right. So many <laughs> consultants. Oh my goodness. Such and, a consultancy. Right. So, and, then, and then they'll say, okay, well, this was probably not the best idea. Um, let's just go straight on chain to the chains that everyone else is using. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, let's pivot a little bit because, I mean, you mentioned a couple of things. Um, one, that you are the co-founder. And I think, are you also CEO of the Pareto Network or just co-founder? Uh, we're co-founders. I mean, we have yeah. some loose, you know, executive and leadership roles, um, but it really functions more like a trust or foundation. Mm -hmm. um, so we really do maintain this kind of uh, horizontal hi hierarchy uh -huh. while so, propelling a protocol. Okay, so you're propelling a protocol as a foundation. Tell me about this. How do you how do you function as a foundation with the uh, goodwill, I imagine, intent and the intent of a foundation while pro propelling a protocol? What is that about? Well, the foundation is not aligned to necessarily make revenues. And so one of the entities, the main entity building the infrastructure, um, doesn't really have a goal of making revenue. Like it did a token sell and it spends that um, and expands the market for this protocol. The, uh, I mean, that's pretty much it. And then we also have special purpose vehicles that do um, extract value from the infrastructure we make. Okay, so what are these special purpose vehicles? To the average consumer, like what does this mean to the person that goes to Pareto Network's website? What are they gonna get? What do you mm -hmm. offer? So let's talk about the Pareto Network. You know, it's a financial intel marketplace for traders and investors. Basically, if you have information, you can disclose it and make money. At the same time, our protocol allows for our members to, or members of the Pareto Network to understand why the information is objective. Then the key part is all of the compensation, all the value of information is determined by the market. So other systems don't really have that feature. Even um, so our, our actual most similar system is called an alpha capture system, which some investment banks use. And what is an alpha capture system that, that works similarly? Um, Marshall Waste. This is a um, system called MW Tops. They, uh, they're probably the first alpha capture system, but all of them, so it's the idea of an alpha capture system is to make more money than, a, than holding a benchmark. So if you okay. wanted to just be a very passive investor, you buy the S&P 500 index and just leave it. If you want to brag about your alpha, you would be investing in all these other things and comparing that to how much you would have made by just doing nothing and holding the S&P 500. So right. alpha capture systems try to really um, amplify the trades you can find and make. So that's what we've built um, with 
some additional privacy, anonymity, end-to-end -end encryption, and some other key aspects that really expand where those information sources can come from. Okay, so what, how does that um, information source expand it? Like through people being more anonymous, they can actually be divulging more? Or uh, how does that work? Um, that's one aspect. Um, now, the system itself requires anonymity, not really for, not only for the information, but for how fair the information is distributed. So the people that host the Pareto Network, they don't know what's in their servers. They don't know what information is in their server because they're market participants in this system too. Right. Um, so the anonymity and the encryption is so that the hosts can't undermine the game. Now, for society's sake, yes, this does also have the effect of, you know, making information or, or allowing people to disclose things they wouldn't have otherwise disclosed. So it, you know, removes the chilling from some of their speech and expression. And does it also, is it kind of like uh, it makes insider trading not inside? It lets insider trading be something that is not just available inside anymore. Is that, is that kind of what it does? Um, the system can do that. Yeah, the system can do that. Um, the system itself, you know, is largely agnostic to the asset class. Sure, so, yeah. so, you know, I can think of maybe six capital markets it deals with, securities being, you know, one of those, and then some circumstances in the securities market, you know, may involve insider trading. Um, but yeah, you know, it's just a small segment. And if there were any barriers for them, uh, they're gone now. So um, <clears throat> let people know. The, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let people know. <laughs> right. but, but even other places like, you know, like even with, you know, software vulnerabilities, you know, you have a lot of misalignments in how very knowledgeable computer programmers and hackers are, you know, existing. So I feel like as a programmer, I feel like the, uh, there, there's kind of a balance where most programmers aren't hacking everybody, but if they weren't compensated as they were, weren't so distracted, like they would. Right. <laughs> um, and so, so you see, so you see, you know, occasionally you see all these massive breaches because these problems are always there, but there's a burgeoning scene about how to get companies to pay for these breaches. Like you find the breach, but you don't actually weaponize uh, it. Right, right. The weaponizing is actually, you just, you just turn it into an economic model rather than a weaponizing model. Right, right. And so right now the companies, you know, they, they're just really disjointed in how they do it. They don't really get the concept of, hey, hack us. And right. um, it's a big mess, even that. So they have an idea of responsible disclosure, but software engineers aren't really aligned to do it. Even right. with Google and Apple's giant bug bounties, you know, you're talking about $10,000. You spend a right. lot of time, then you have to argue with the company, right. have them, hey, please don't sue me. Um, when you could have made like a few million dollars. So yeah, now the exactly. that changes the incentives um, and they let the market decide the value of that exploit. Okay, so to change those incentives, and, and I love this, I love this idea because I'm thinking about it actually, I'm getting my like sociology hat on for a second here. My futurism hat, sounds like you're a bit of a futurist yourself if you were getting involved in crypto in 2011. So, <laughs> yeah, sounds like it. All right, so let's just, for a second, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna try to think of this metaphorically and, and analog, analogously for a second. So um, currently we have a punitive system, right? You break the law, you go to prison. You, right. you, we are gonna punish, punish you, we call it corrections, that's broken, but even if it wasn't broken, the idea is you've done something wrong, you get corrected and you get reintroduced. And right. that has to happen. Now, if we change the system from being one of what you've done is inherently wrong to what you've done is, and it needs to be corrected, is to what something that we need to, if in this sense of, of just, not I'm, talking, I'm not talking about violent crime, but like if you're just talking about white collar crime and you're talking about hacking, if we now just turn this into a simply economic discussion and we say, actually, what you've done is a good thing, you've exposed a problem that we have. I guess right. in the same way that somebody who has violent tendencies, they've exposed that there's a fissure in the community that needs to be addressed because there, that wouldn't be behavior that is truly um, synergistic with our species. So it's just not working, right? So rather than like it's to jettison it off and say it must be corrected to say, oh, I'm so glad you brought that to the group. We need to actually correct this internally. And so now yeah. we want to create a, an economy around this so that we can incentivize people to go ahead and explore that if you want to, because if you expose that we have a weakness, we're going to all benefit from it. 
And if you're in the way that you're shifting yeah. the market around that and to make that actually monetized and, and people to uh, giving, giving more people to have a voice and what the value is of that, you're kind of beginning to inch us towards a non punitive direction, right? I mean, and towards more of a collaborative discussion around our weaknesses, whether it's around an organization or technology or even a society's weaknesses. Um, exactly. And when you, you know, also look at what these exploits are, these are problems that should have been solved. These are right. companies not using the best Much practice. like violent crime. I mean, a problem that should have been solved a long time ago, you'd think. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's a good analogy. Um, so, you know, these hackers are, you know, they're catalysts to solving a problem that another hacker was going to find or somebody else is going to exploit. And the um, newfangled, before Pareto, the newfangled mark, market extenders, the bug bounties, mm -hmm. uh, they've been inching upwards in value over time, but the problems in how these are valued are still very unilateral. Um, you can basically, if you look into the life of a bug bounty researcher, the life is to do all this really strange, esoteric stuff to find uh, exploit. You have all the big Fortune 500 companies, everybody, and then hope they pay you. And a lot of times <laughs> you find things, and I can tell you one right now. Okay. On Facebook Messenger, you can look at any attachment, any picture someone adds, and get the URL of that. And you can change aspects of the URL under a pattern to find attachments anyone has posted. Ooh. And a, a, a researcher found that, and this was always like this. A researcher found this and said, hey, this is a privacy issue. And Facebook said, no, it's a feature. We're not going to pay you anything. And so I don't know if it's still there. Um, I don't know if this was the most accurate description of this particular exploit or feature. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the market itself might have a different value for that. Um, right. This researcher didn't necessarily want to actually, you know, exploit or try to see what right. kind of things they could find. They could probably find, you know, public company details shared over Facebook right. messages that were private. Um, but instead, they can just disclose this to the network. White hat or black hat, they're not, they don't seem to be looking at it and wanting to address it. I exactly. Think. They can just get monetized. So it, it shifts the liability. So first they can get money from it without weaponizing something. So the, the liability is completely shifted. They just got paid for information. Right. People on the network, they can do whatever they want. They can be white hat, black hat. They can just be a person that likes to but collect. Really, if you're smart enough to know to do it, then you just do it and you're contributing with it no matter what. Exactly. Exactly. So it can align the incentives better. It can still get the security holes patched. The market's going to be more efficient. Wow, that's incredible. It sounds like you are, have been doing some really forward thinking stuff for a long time. Um, and you, like you're way ahead of the curve on this. Do you have any- hey, that's, um, why, that's why I'm in San Francisco now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, are you seeing that New York is behind? <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a lot of like-minded um, people out here. I need to be closer to the protocols. I understand. You have to be closer to the protocols. Uh huh. <laughs> Um, you, there's one last thing you said you were, what was the note I took? I, it was, a, it was an interesting way that you phrased it. You said you're a pioneer activist investor in projects. What, what do you mean by that? Is that, I mean, it seems like it's along the same line of this, um, as this incredible futurism that you're not only doing in FinTech, but, uh, but in, uh, is it social tech almost? So. Sure. So, so basically, um, I did activist investing in crypto projects. Um, now this is inspired by activist investors and corporate raiders like Carl Icahn or Warren Buffett um, before he became the conservative investment guru guy. Um, basically, these guys went into undervalued companies and changed management and changed how the company functioned. Uh, now, in crypto, it was great. It's been great because there is no company you need to change management of and all the projects are open source. So what I saw was a lot of people seem wanting to understand that decentralized, you know, libertarian dream or something, but nobody was doing anything. So when I saw an undervalued crypto project, there's a token or coin trading on exchanges or just in the market at a lower price than I think it should, then I could come in, offer a new vision. And I've already bought like a lot of the coin before I do this. Right. And, um, also hire some software engineers to 
really make things useful to the market. Um, so I guess like one of my very first public projects was um, doing this in 2016 in a, a coin that's very similar to Monero. Mm -hmm. Very obscure coin, but um, basically I did this and you know made a great profit and have been kind of riding off the coattails of that for that's the last fantastic. couple of years. Wow, that's that's incredible. Well done. Are you able to disclose what that coin was, or is yeah, it sure. the Bullberry project? Um, the Bull Bullberry is a cousin of Monero, as in basically they have the same common ancestor, mm -hmm. but they forked off um, very early. And uh, so I was just there maybe maybe for a good six months or so, and before the community itself, you know, ended up taking that further. Wow. Um, I saw that in other coins too. Um, she's like, you have to remember this other privacy coin called Verge was originally called Dogecoin Dark. So it's just like, people can always just kind of flip the script and right. make these things um, get taken Take a lot more seriously. Well, yeah. Everything's the same. Everything's the right. same. <laughs> Dogecoin Dark. That is so cool. Dogecoin Dark. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. Well, do you have anything else that you want to make sure we, we talk about? I mean, we're going to have links to all of your projects that you've mentioned here and your social. Okay. Uh, people can catch up with you on, it's, it looks like you're very active on media, a little bit on Quora. You've put a lot of content out. Um, anything right. else you'd like to make sure we touch on before we go? Um, sure. I'd just like to mention, you know, a lot of times I'm here to inspire. Uh, so a lot of my writings are trying to just push the market in a little bit towards how I perceive things, which has been, at least some of my perspectives have been very forward leading, I guess. Um, other people independently come to the same conclusions later on. Um, so that's, that's pretty much what my writings are about on Medium and Quora. The, definitely pay attention to what we're doing in the Pareto Network as, uh, as it gets uh, more advanced. Um, this really changes how information is gonna be distributed and make its way to the market. It's wonderful. It's absolutely fantastic. I love the way that you're affecting the crowdsource, essentially like the valuation of, of information. And uh, hopefully we can have a less weaponized world, even as we discover faults in one another and, and, and in uh, the organizations around us. Well, thank you so much, Eric. I really appreciate you taking the time. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. Yes, this has been great. All right. Well, this is uh, Monica Prophet. I'm signing off with Eric Lamison-White um, at the New Trust Economy. We'll catch you next time. Thanks.